Glad to have you on, Andrew. You uh, run a podcast called Miriosity with some other folks. Not all of them are Anglican, but a lot of them are, are Anglican, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, uh, we've chatted before. I chatted with you on the Miriosity podcast uh, about Anglicanism in general, and I think that was a great conversation. Um, so I had to set up another conversation. I'm glad that we can we can um, talk about development of doctrine in this. Uh, I think a lot of people think development of doctrine is like a Roman thing, like only Roman Catholics, only Newman Knights like the idea of development of doctrine. What does it mean? Um, and in one sense, you know, how how is that phrase abused? How is it properly understood? And I think it'd be fun to talk about it today um, on the channel. Sure. Yeah, I'm happy to be back. I loved our conversation last time. And yeah, we're, I wouldn't say mostly Anglican, but we definitely have an Anglican influence at Miriosity. Our goal, I don't know how well we're doing it. I think we do a good job, but we're, we're trying to bring the, the classroom into the YouTube sphere and clear up some of the clutter um, of internet theology. Not to yeah. say by, not to say in any way we're perfect, but our, our kind of mission, our goal is to bring those conversations that we had that we enjoyed so much in undergrad and graduate schools. Our, our whole team, at least the ones talking, have some level of graduate work in theology and just kind of bring that into the YouTube sphere. So sometimes our biases show when I'm talking, it's going to be very Anglican focused, kind of that ecclesiology. Um, but hopefully we're mostly successful in our mission. We've got a Catholic on board. We've got a more low church, uh, evangelical and we're just trying to bring history and theology and present it in somewhat of an unbiased way. <laughs> yeah. But in some sense, I guess, having all the different perspectives is, is, is Anglican in itself, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Every, everyone wins. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for sure. All right. And then we'll talk about development of doctrine. Probably I mean, both of us are Anglican. We will probably talk about the different perspectives, but we'll maybe emphasize what, what would an Anglican accept or not accept about different understandings of development of doctrine. Um, I definitely have my thoughts. I've been looking into this a lot lately. I think a lot of people will talk about the Vincentian canon and we'll get all into that. I think the thing I wanted to highlight at the outset is that every Christian tradition has this idea of the apostolic deposit. So all Orthodox Christians agree on the, the basic premise that what is to be believed is what the apostles believed. Now, there, there are some very strong versions of development of doctrine, which kind of use the, you know, really go far with the kind of seed in the tree analogy that the apostolic deposit that the um, uh, that the apostles believed was kind of the seed of faith. And it's, you know, blossomed and turned into a full tree that has all these different um, aspects to it. You'll see a lot of people defend the papacy with this kind of talking, this kind of way of thinking. Um, and then I think, you know, it's, it's impossible to talk about development of doctrine without talking about um, Newman's original articulation of it. Um, and I think one of the interesting parts about Newman is that he, I think, has a very, you know, he's writing in the 19th century. And mm -hmm. a lot has changed in the way that Rome talks about their doctrines and how they talk about change and how they talk about development. And um, even in Newman's lifetime, the office of the papacy was elevated. You know, he had his concerns about Vatican I. Um, but at the core, everybody believes in the, the 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 idea of what's been called sola apostolica, like that that the apostolic teachings are at the center of of our faith, and that the apostles had a kind of purist doctrine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Go. Sorry. Did you? Uh, want I, to... okay, yeah. I think I think what 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 starts to if you look into church history, people start to mm -hmm. notice is that they might have the purist doctrine, but they don't have the most clear doctrines. Mm -hmm. So as time has gone on, we've invented language, we've started using articulations, we've used verbiage to get across to people what what we were trying to say. So there's this understanding that the oldest doctrines are the purest, right? Because mm -hmm. we don't, we want to kind of ward off innovations, um, but, but that people get more clear over time. So there, there's this tension then there between, you know, going as far back as possible and trying to look as much like them and then kind of trying to be clear and articulating uh, um, what we believe. And there's maybe a tension there, but there's also a compliment you know, uh, th those two ideas complement each other because as time goes on, you can get a very pure and clear doctrine articulated by, you know, now we've got a bunch of different denominations who have their own systematic mm -hmm. theologies who really go into the nitty gritty of all the different corners of theology and articulate it as they do. 
Um, and I would say that's the, you know, the, the, the Protestant Reformation was appealing to this under this universally understood idea about Sola Apostolica, that the, the, the original deposit of faith was the purest. And that because we all agree the Bible is infallible mm. in a way, maybe that nothing else is that going to the Bible is the kind of natural conclusion of this universal Christian hermeneutic. Right. Yeah. And I think definitely for, for reformed or Protestant traditional Protestants, that is, that is the key. Like that is, that is the source. Right. And I think something you mentioned is really important because a lot of people, mostly Protestants uh, and evangelicals, but I'd say even a lot of Catholics don't understand about their own theology is that, yeah, there was this deposit of faith with the apostles and with the death of the last apostles, it was done. Like there was nothing more, nothing more said. And anything that can come like authoritatively from the church had to be from that deposit of faith. A lot of times people will hear that and say like, oh, that's Protestant jargon, like that's Protestant mumbo jumbo. But that is a consistent belief. Uh, we can make our own arguments and how much the Catholic Church cared about that in the Middle Ages. But um, as long as we're just following the letter of the law, this is just a consistent belief of, of doctrine and authority of the church. Uh, and what they can teach, what they can hold people to. So I definitely, um, well, maybe that's where I'll stop for now. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think that's, that's, that's definitely, I mean, that's the core of, of, of it. You can find official statements in Vatican one and Vatican two, even and places where the, the Roman magisterium has articulated that that is what they're, that that's what they believe that there's this once for all delivered faith to the apostles. And I think it's becoming more and more relevant to kind of, talk about that and reassert that idea, you know, when there are conversations, you know, we will, probably won't get into this today, but like on icons or the papacy, or even today, you know, in, in, with, with um, uh, liberalism or, or people saying, oh yeah, in the past, this was okay, but time has changed and time has progressed. And if we have time, we'll get into conversations about like the moral law progress over time and uh, you know, conversations about that. But really, this is just about the the, the deposit of, of faith. A good example of what we would say uh, is acceptable development, I would say, is the use of the word Trinity. So like we would affirm that, yeah, the word Trinity doesn't appear in the Bible. It might not even appear in some of the earliest church fathers as the word Trinity. But the 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 word accurately describes the doctrine described in the Bible. Mm -hmm. So the and that was what the apostles believed. Even the idea that the New Testament, all, all, almost all of the New Testament authors are apostles and they're describing their doctrine. So, uh, you know, we can talk about like Mark and Luke and stuff who are recording the Gospels, but everyone else are apostles um, talking about uh, basically just describing what the apostles believe. The reason that that matters is because of this idea of sola apostolica mm -hmm. um, and that that's the, the faith we kind of have to um, kind of support and kind of uphold um, as Christians, uh, and, and deviating from that saying, you can't, you know, you can't really get around this by saying, oh, that was then that's not mm -hmm. really an acceptable option for, right. for us finally. Yeah. Well, and that's a key component. So, so I addressed the uh, misconception about Catholic theology. Now we can jump in on, on the Protestants back too. um, is there is a misunderstanding there with a lot of Protestants who do look at, at Newman and say like, oh, Newman created this idea of development of doctrine and that's novel, and it was just an excuse to defend accretions. And, and whether you think that might be true, the actual concept development of doctrine, you're right, goes all the way back. It is, it's a consistent belief throughout the history of the church. And the biggest example, I mean, it's one Catholic apologists use a lot, but Protestants can claim it too, for sure. Um, just, yeah, Nicaea, that Trinitarian, that like Athanasius Trinitarian language is not in the New Testament. Um, all of the ingredients, the Trinity is in the New Testament. And if you read Athanasius, um, and I just keep bringing him up because, you know, he's the big Trinity guy and it's his theology that we've adapted as the church. Um, he makes it, I mean, he makes it very clear. He makes what you could call a sola scriptura argument himself, that this is beyond clear. It's not only the teaching of the apostles, it's present in their writings in the New Testament. Um, but these words are being twisted. Uh, we've got Arius going 
into the Old Testament to try and contradict some of these statements in the New Testament and say, like, here's where John was wrong. Here's why Jesus equating himself to the Father or giving us the baptismal formula isn't this. Here, here's what it means that Jesus is the first among all creation. And Athanasius is not saying, oh, wow, this is interesting. These are two competing views and we don't know what the apostles taught. He's saying, no, you're you're deviating from this teaching that we find in Scripture and because of that, it's necessary now, and this is the language Athanasius used, it's necessary that one, we have this council, um, or had this council, it had already happened, and two, that we develop a strong, um, impermeable theology explaining this teaching in Scripture. And yeah. key word there, develop. Uh, the doctrine, the, the truth and reality of the Trinity is apostolic and straight from the New Testament. But the development of Trinitarian Nicene theology, um, Christian, Nicene Christianity, that, that was developed through the guidance mm -hmm. of the Holy Spirit, no doubt, but a development. Yeah. yeah. And, and, that's, and Protestants shouldn't be afraid to say that or talk about that, I think, because many Protestants want to uphold, you know, oh, oh, well, sola scriptura means that we have to kind of use scriptural language for everything and then you know you'll talk you get some people who will talk about like oh greek languages greek categories kind of seeping in you know what does um athens have to do with jerusalem kind of way of thinking and worrying about that but you can even find in the gospel of john like the use of the word logos in some sense right the use of terminology that was common to a greek understanding to appeal to articulate the same doctrine that was taught in the other gospels and he's just using this new language in that way to articulate the same idea, um, it, given uh, new categories or new controversies. I mean, I think that's that's the next. I mean, if you don't believe in any kind of development of doctrine, then when we come up to a new point of controversy, which is really what all of these uh, pivot points are, that's what Nicaea was, is there was right. a controversy and they wanted to settle it. And so then we had to say, OK, well, what do you believe? Use as much language as you can to say what you believe and then we'll say what we believe. And then we'll kind of try to hash out who is closest to the to to the, the, the biblical understanding, to the apostolic understanding, and then move on. And then after we've moved on, you can say we've moved on. The Council of Nicaea settled that issue. We know the language. You either fall on this side of the argument or you fall on that side of the argument now. There's not as much um, um, confusion. There's um, kind of the idea that you see in Hebrews of like kind of shaking up the church so that, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, the impure elements kind of come out. And that's what these moments are. So, I mean, we can talk about the, the role of councils in Protestant theology in a minute, but I think uh, there, there is definitely a, a, an idea of these conflict points being used to illumine the truth. You could even talk about the Protestant Reformation in this way, right? That, you know, before the Protestant Reformation, there really wasn't, you know, an ecumenical council on the issue of justification that mm -hmm. clarified what the proper belief is. And you can find even by the time Martin Luther is articulating you know, he's in the monastery, he's having scrupulosity about his prayer life and about confession and all that stuff. And his, uh, Johann Stalpitz, I think it is, is the one who says to him, well, you know, justification is by faith alone. And, you know, mm -hmm. so you can move on. So there were already people who kind of had different understandings that might be considered uh, more like the Protestant understanding growing up alongside um, the people who would articulate visions that the Roman Catholic Church would identify with their with their opinion on justification today. And it's not until this conflict point that they separate and you're forced. I mean, we're all forced, you know, maybe this is an effect of the fall, but we're still forced nonetheless to use kind of our private judgment to go search the scriptures and say, well, which of these positions fits the apostolic deposit as we've inherited today mm -hmm. um, and, and kind of follow, follow that train where it leads. So if you and you can do this with any controversy, take um, the filioque controversy. Really, that's two branches of the church, um, you know, the East and the West. And they were debating about the hypostatic procession versus energetic procession. And, you know, we don't have to get into the details of the different positions. But basically, you can find, in some extent, people of both persuasions in church history. Both, both sides will agree that there are people on, uh, on that would, would kind of side with one side or the other at different points. Augustine seems to articulate a clear uh, version of the hypostatic procession of the filioque in in his works on the trinity um but then there are uh, you know some cappadocian fathers who who maybe don't um and you know people like basil or are, are are you know as a westerner i might say that he is on our side but still there's an idea that they were kind of both 
together. Then the controversy hits. And then we have to say, okay, all right, what does the Bible say about this? And we have to slow down, mm -hmm. get precise language and talk about what we mean. And I, I don't think, you know, most of the church before this split in 1054 would have had the terminology hypostatic procession versus energetic mm -hmm. procession and all of these kinds of different terms to talk about how does the sun proceed or how does the spirit proceed from the sun um, until the controversy hits. And then, you know, you, you can't really go back once the controversy hits to a point where we just agree to disagree. Now you kind of have to lay down which, which side of the development you're on. Mm -hmm. and, and the only reason you would go one way or the other is again, to kind of return to the apostolic deposit as, as you, you know, as we apprehended. Yeah. So there's so much there. I, I don't want to jump too fast in, um, in, in church history. So let me spend the first part of this going all the way back to the beginning. Um, for those mm -hmm. that might be wary of that term development of doctrine. Um, the, the key there too, for us is, is kind of using terms like refinement and remembering that the apostolic deposit is a part of the concept of development of doctrine uh, and that we are what we are doing. And again, the Holy Spirit guides the church. Um, but through that guidance, we as, as those instruments, the church and the leaders, right? The first, we can just go back to Paul ordaining the second generation of the church. Uh, what was Timothy and Epaphroditus's role if it wasn't to help interpret the scriptures and pass down the apostolic deposit? So we know that in a sense, all we're doing, all that all that's happening in, in this process is the leaders in the church, and it, and it does go down to the lay people as well, and we'll talk about that later. They, they are refining a truth that already exists. They're not changing it. They're not adding to or taking from it. And, and they're providing clarification, um, definition, explanation, um, theological integration maybe through time and place. And yeah, usually this comes up when there is a controversy, but sometimes it comes up uh, in, in really kind of boring situations. We can fall into this trap, and we'll talk about the Restorationists later, who aren't Protestants, um, that, that say, like, no, all of this is wrong, no creed but the Bible. And and it's funny, this is actually my dad's response to them. He says, okay, well, then I hope that no Restorationist pastor preaches on Sunday. Uh, hopefully, they're, hopefully they're just reading, standing up, reading scripture, and then going home. Mm -hmm. um, clearly, interpretation yeah. and... and um, representing the same truths in different language so that they can be understood was the intention of the apostles and Jesus himself when he started the church. Um, yeah. It's it's a church through time and place. It doesn't change, but it does require this refinement process and people butting heads and ultimately the church receiving these conclusions as either orthodox or heretical. And sometimes that's messy. Sometimes it takes time. Some things are more clear than others, but in, if, if development of doctrine is a scary term to you, you can maybe just think more of continual interpretation of the one apostolic faith, the positive faith given to us 2000 years ago. Yeah, definitely. And we can talk. I mean, I, I think there's a there's there's a reasonable articulation that even events recorded in Acts like the Council of Jerusalem were in some sense a recognition of the role of the visible organs of the church mm -hmm. to kind of reinforce what was always believed. Nobody thinks that the Council of Jerusalem was, in some sense, them changing their doctrine. Mm -hmm. You know, by that point, Peter had already gotten his whole, you know, the white, Acts 10, white blanket over all of the things, all the nations are clean um, kind of uh, articulation. But what happened is there's this visible moment where everyone sees, okay, here's what the church believes. And it's now been clearly articulated on how that plays itself out in the church life, right? Because even in act, it's like, well, we all agree that 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 all of the nations are can be brought into the covenant. But what about circumcision? What does that mean for mm -hmm. this? What does that 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 apostolic truth entail for um, practical, uh, you know, uh, the practices of the church and, and, and the way we live our lives? And, you know, you made me think I don't want to deviate too much, but you also mm -hmm. like this is this just came to my mind. And this is mm -hmm. less official because this is not like a, an ecumenical council. But uh, in the same way, like responding to situations, responding to different contexts, we have mm -hmm. the first 300 years of the church that Eusebius records where the church is under the pressure of the sword. And then we've got post-Constantine where now the church is holding the sword over the 
whole world essentially is the Roman Empire. Maybe that's too Rome centric, but you know, <laughs> yeah. at least in their minds. And so we've got Augustine saying, well, what do we do now that we're the ones with the sword? I have to come up with war theory. Christians yeah. have never had to go to war before. Yeah. And, and then how do we engage with this new context, this new situation in, mm -hmm. in a way that's faithful to the apostolic deposit? That's right. that's the challenge of the Christian. Mm -hmm. It's not like, you know, we've got this new, you know, because you'll see some maybe more liberal Christians talking about, oh, well, it's a new context. It's a new idea. We've never interacted with it. So we can kind of do whatever we want now. Mm -hmm. But that's not really the the heart of 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 the of the of the faith. I mean, the, the idea is that you would have to be um, true to how. Mm -hmm how the the apostolic deposit would be applied in this situation yeah it's a it's a temptation but it's not it's <laughs> definitely not what we're supposed to do yeah and so when we're actually you know sitting down to you know we got a new situation or we've got a new controversy the the tools we're using to solve these controversies in in a way that's actually in my opinion the dividing line between the you know some people might call them the ecclesialist traditions and the protestant traditions and the restorationist positions those three mm. different kind of ways of of dealing with um doctrine because the ecclesialist will say something like yeah we've got scripture but scripture is a part of this broader you know context called tradition the church tradition mm -hmm. and that's how we solve these you know controversies or how, that's how we come to theological disputations about all these things and if something isn't recorded in scripture that doesn't mean it's not recorded in tradition. So we can, right. you know, use that as a source versus the kind of magisterial Protestant approach, which was, okay, we've got this controversy and, and in their time it was justification. So let's look at what the Bible says as, because we know the Bible's infallible and we don't have, you know, at this point it had been 1500 years since the apostolic deposit was delivered and not all of this other stuff was written down, you know, even if you can, if you want to appeal to the idea of Paul saying, hold fast to the traditions I gave you orally or, uh, written or written by word or by word of mouth, you know, it's been 1500 years. Who knows what the word of mouth traditions were with, with as much um, uh, clarity and conviction, you know, then we could start talking about like, Oh, well, Irenaeus is dealing with heretics and the, who, who claim, you know, word of mouth traditions and he rebukes them and all those different debates. But really this is just about how do we approach um, development of doctrine moments and um, then the restorationist position would would be oh so the sorry I'm I'm getting ahead of myself yeah. the magisterial Protestant tradition would say that the scripture is infallible so anything that's it's in scripture is the most amount of certainty but if you read you know any of the Protestant reformers they saw the tradition as be, as being something that that kind of held their held their feet to the fire you know people will talk about you know baptismal regeneration the real presence as reasons to become Roman Catholic today but. All of the early Protestant reformers, I mean, we can talk about Zwingli, but like Calvin, mm. Luther, all of the Anglicans, they, they wanted to be able to say we believe in the real presence because they felt like, well, I'm I'm liable to this doctrine that is articulated pretty universally in the church fathers mm. because is, I'm not supposed to be deviating. Yeah, you that know? is my biggest gripe. I'll, I'll, <laughs> uh, you've probably seen me anytime I get an opportunity, I always talk about this. Um, absolutely. And so the Eucharist, mm. we'll get back on track. But yeah, the, the <laughs> real real presence of Christ in the Eucharist was a paramount to the magisterial reformers. And I like to point out, it's always nice to point to Zwingli and say, well, look, look at Zwingli. Where is his tradition? Uh, nothing yeah. came. Nothing came from him. Uh, there, yeah. there are some there are some evangelicals who are like reviving his theology to try and defend their view of the Eucharist. But in mm -hmm. reality, like. Yeah, yeah. The real pre the, the sacraments of Christ that we would say, right, like the two primary mm -hmm. sacraments. Um, real presence of Christ, baptism actually doing something, maybe not for the Baptists, they came later, but were, it was key. But anyway, sorry, I hope I didn't yeah. distract you too much. No, I think that's true. And and basically, this is just to point out that, you know, the idea that Protestants didn't think they were beholden to tradition, mm -hmm. or that they didn't understand, like, hey, the church has held something, that means it's authoritative, you know, is, is wrong. Because, and in that sense, they do kind of have a development of doctrine, an understanding of, okay, well, this label, this theology has been used by the church and has been vindicated. We'll talk about vindication in a minute too, but like the idea is, you know, uh, if, if like you're saying, if Zwingli's church is kind of gone today, that's probably has something to do with the idea that the spirit was not kind of entirely okay with this theological element or something. And we can hash that out as time goes on. But just the idea that 
uh, I forget it. I think it's Gamaliel or whatever in Acts who says, if this is of God, it will prosper kind of way of talking about um, these traditions. And, mm -hmm. you know, uh, and that can get taken too far as well. Um, but but the idea that there is some idea that the Holy Spirit is still defend, even if you don't believe that the church traditions are infallible, we understand that the Holy Spirit has actively and visibly been guiding the church uh, on matters of theology and doctrine to preserve the apostolic deposit um, throughout church history. Yeah, totally. And so th that's where um, I guess we're veering towards talking about reception and the, and the importance of that. Um, should we define restorationists? Have we gotten there yet? <laughs> no, no. So, so the restorationist position, I would say, is that the, it, it is the actual rejection of the concept of development of doctrine mm -hmm. for the most part. This, uh, there was this idea that there was the church that Christ founded in the ap apostles believed. Again, they still believe in that sense in a kind of sola apostolica, mm -hmm. but that they don't believe that, that anything that's kind of doesn't, you know, smell like, taste like, you know, look like that first that their their interpretation of what the biblical church looked like from the bible alone um then that's anathema you can't touch it you can't be related to it and they and they they basically reject that in, in an attempt to return the form of the church and the and you know every element of the church to what it looked like in that first generation mm. of apostles which is really the actual rejection of of um development of doctrine. I think one of the big problems with this is the idea that, oh, everything that's old is good would in some sense enable you to become kind of a Gnostic because there mm -hmm. were in the early church heretical groups and they're old. So if somebody said, oh, actually, you know, the group that Paul is rebuking in Corinthians or whatever, I, that's me. I'm them. You would say, well, he is rebuking them. So that's not really a category just because they're old or just because that's ancient. It's not really a category that we can accept. The same thing would be true about Arians, right? We can see that there were Arians before the Council of Nicaea. So they're older than, say, um, I don't know, some later heresy. But that doesn't mean that they're right. So we still have to have some mechanism for resolving these um, these tensions. And being old doesn't mean you're, you're necessarily right. You have to be actually tied to the apostolic deposit, I would say. Yeah. And and so that's I just thought it was important to kind of talk about the restoration movement because we have like the Catholic and, and the magisterial Protestant position. It's kind of the the weight of, you know, tradition over scripture, scripture over tradition. I know Catholics mm -hmm. gonna be mad about that. They're a little equal view. <laughs> We've kind of got I like to call the magisterial Protestants, I would say like capital S scripture and middle T tradition. And I think that that's yeah. lived out like best through the Anglican tradition, obviously, because uh, mm -hmm. it would be a little wrong to say lowercase tradition because in a sense that they do believe in a sort of sacred tradition uh yeah. just not infallible and then yeah the the restorationists for those who aren't familiar with them just briefly they came out of they were kind of right at the beginning of what we call the the burned over movement that originated in new york city but they were like late 1700s early 1800s alexander campbell and barton stone they were really sad about all the denominations that existed and so um, their idea yeah. to solve that and heal the church was to start a new denomination. And <laughs> that gave birth <laughs> to the restoration movement. So all the like Church of God, Church of Christ, Disciples of Christ, pretty sure all of them are, are part of that. And yeah. they're the ones that, um, one, you'll a lot of Catholics, that's what they think Protestants are. Um, but they're, they're the ones that you'll hear saying no creed but the Bible or like tradition is really <laughs> evil and like, that way of thinking has crept its way into a lot of like mega church evangelical circles as well. So the, the lines are a bit blurred, but um, yeah, they would be the ones that kind of use this argument that like there was this deposit of faith. And when the last apostle died, whether it was John or whoever, you know, whatever, 90 AD cut off. Um, and we need to go and resurrect that because the last 1700 years of church history have derailed all of that um, and it's lost and we found it. So mm -hmm. many dangers with that. Um, yeah. I mean, unlimited, but that's also where every single cult uh, comes from. The yeah. Jehovah's yeah. the Jehovah's Witnesses revived Arianism with that yeah. way of thinking. Uh, the Mormons create. I don't know what they revived. They just created something entirely <laughs> new. Or something, um, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, definitely. And 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 to be able to make those distinctions is, is totally key. I think it's interesting because people, you know, we're talking about development of doctrine. People talk about John Henry Newman. Something um, uh, Chris Cristaldo has been able to point out recently is that 
Newman is actually also responding to the restorationists. I think he had a brother who was a, a restorationist, mm. kind of a part of that Campbellite movement. And he like resented it and thought it was ridiculous and didn't feel like he could combat it and was having all of these kinds of conflicts with that perspective. Because if you actually read his essay on the development of doctrine, he says at the beginning that most magisterial Protestants accept development of doctrine mm -hmm. and, and then just goes on to talk about what he thinks. So it's not really, this isn't the real dividing line between uh, ecclesialists and, and Protestants. It's really the dividing line between um, us and restorationists. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So, all right. We've talked about... Um, the idea of antiquity being a, being a plus. So like when we're mm -hmm. trying to figure out our doctrines, antiquity, we're also talking about articulation, the element of, of development of doctrine, where it's just kind of the doctrine getting clearer. And we've touched on this that I want to talk a little bit more about, which is vindication or reception. Mm -hmm. So the idea is, you know, people, when they hear about like, well, do you think all the church count ecumenical councils are infallible? Are they just authoritative? What's our position? And then people will point out, well, there were ecumenical councils that looked ecumenical at the time that nobody now looks at as having been infallible. Like, uh, I think Hyria is a good example of this. Mm -hmm. Even the people that would now probably identify with Hyria reject the idea of infallible councils. So um, it, it's it's interesting to see what the logic behind councils is and what's the difference between, um, you know, can can Anglicans to some extent say that we, we hold to... The councils, the ecumenical mm -hmm. councils, you know, um, as having authority in themselves. Like, how would we articulate that? How would we walk around those ideas? Yeah. So I would say, um, let me just broadly say what I think, and then and then we can branch out from there. Yeah. Um, yeah. Th this is key. I, I think there are three primary components of uh, reception of these doctrines, reception of development of doctrine, whatever you want to call it, of of what makes something takes it from being an idea to being like orthodox catholic theology um and one of course is it's got to be part of the apostolic deposit so there we go so far so good with catholics yeah. protestants orthodox we're all we're all on par here um and then two again we would all agree that um it has to be defended by church authority this cannot be an idea that just one person has uh, that is, this is a safeguard against the formation of cults and just diving deep into heresy there is a stream of orthodoxy as um uh, Steve, uh, I always forget his name, great historian at Southeastern uh, mm -hmm. Seminary, but there's a stream of orthodoxy that we're on. And that's kind of what binds us there is the authorities in the church uh, have to make these statements and defend these. It can't just be a rogue movement within. So one, we've got the apostolic deposit. Two, we've got the leaders in the church generally coming together in councils if it gets bad enough, right? There's a lot. We we mark seven councils. The Catholic Church talks about 21. In reality, there have probably been like 40,000 local councils in church history. Mm -hmm. That's a random number, but so many, so, so many, because that's how the church operates. That's the instruction that we got in the Council of Jerusalem in Acts 15. Yeah. So, yeah, the second is has to be defended by the authorities in the church, uh, primarily bishops, we would say, in these councils. And then the third part is key because that's not enough. Right. Like I said, we have all these councils for every council. I don't remember who said this, but it's just a fact. There was a robber council. You know, there yeah. was Hyria. Can't really pronounce it. There was the council um, in the mid 700s with the Catholic Church and the Franks uh, that happened before the Seventh Ecumenical Council. That's not received there. Councils mm -hmm. all over the place. And a lot of these ecumenical councils, well, everyone during, you know, the first thousand years of the undivided church, they always started. The first canon, the first statement was, this is the blank ecumenical council that is consistent and in line with the previous however many, you know, previous mm -hmm. four, previous five. And it is uh, the proper interpretation of all of that and application of the deposit of faith. So they all say that. And so this mm -hmm. is where I've blabbed on long enough. The third component, we've got the apostolic deposit, the uh, defense of the authorities in the church through councils. And then third takes time. That is reception. Yeah. That is the um, reception of this teaching and embracing of it with, by the faithful, by the practicing. The, the term Catholics use, which Protestants need to grab hold of, is the census fide, the sense mm -hmm. of the faithful. That is the, that's the final test, right? Because we have Arius arguing with the majority of bishops, apparently, if that's true, that uh, Jesus was created. 
Yeah. And we, um, I don't know if they held a council that, and probably not back then, but yeah, I'm sure there was some local synod that affirmed Arian heresy. Constantine uh, died an Arian, um, I think, at least I've read he was baptized by one on his deathbed. Mm -hmm. Was it Eusebius of Nicomedia? He was, uh, so there were lots of that, but we see now, oh, okay, it took time, but it is clear as day that the church rejected this teaching as heresy. Yeah. So that yeah. that last component, the sense of the faithful, the actual practice of the church is important. Mm -hmm. And that that points to a bigger truth, too, that it's not just the job of the layperson is not just to sit back and watch the authorities in the church do their thing. Um, Catholicity, receiving Orthodox doctrine and faithfully interpreting the deposit of faith is a, a top down operation. It, it requires. The where we get the confirmation, the check mark that this was right is the practice of the church through time. Yeah. And and what I think is is important that, that you said is that it's actually not a matter of in the moment, do the majority of people agree with this or do they not? Because we would mm -hmm. all, you know, the, the nickname of Athanasius, who was def, def, you know, arguing against Ant, uh, Arianism, was Athanasius Contramundum, Athanasius against the world. Everybody mm -hmm. was Arian is the implication. And he was the only one being faithful. And we would all recognize now, you know, Catholic, Protestant, Orthodox, whatever, that 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 he was wrong. I mean, mm -hmm. that the Arians were wrong and that, mm -hmm. that he was was right. And you can see this articulation, you know, are, are we just making this up? No, because St. Vincent de Lorraine in his commonatory lays out this. He says it's possible for most bishops to be heretics and this to be a problem, but that over time, the truth will win. And you might be in a, an era, he says, where like there's only one faithful bishop and you have to stick to your bishop and that the ultimate source of authority was the apostolic deposit. And you just have to be true to that, even if it makes you alone. But over time, what will happen is, you know, the Arians will, you know, they go from being, again, Constantine, the emperor is an Arian to being like, OK, well, a bunch of tribes on the outskirts of the Roman Empire are Arians, but, you know, they're kind of on the margin to like a couple hundred years later, there's no more Arians anymore. And uh, that's because the, what we would call Chalcedonian Christianity just, you know, prospers, blooms, spreads all over. Um, and, uh, the, you know, we can talk about the differences with like the Coptic church and stuff like that, but there's no Arian churches alive today because we would say because of their error, because mm -hmm. of the promise given to us by Christ that he would send his Holy Spirit to protect us um, uh, into the ages and that the, the church would be the pillar of truth in, in that, in that sense. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I just, that point is key. And I, I, I don't, I don't know. I don't think many Catholics would really disagree with me either. The, the only, the only difference there is now they would say, well, the Pope has to call the council and that settles it. You know, like the day mm -hmm. the Vatican two ended, they're like, you go ecumenical council. Yeah. Um, but I, I at least think Catholics who know their history would agree that that is not how it's worked through time. Uh, yeah. that, that that is something that came later. But these three components, for sure, we we have to trust. We 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 believe in God, right? We we're not yeah. deists. We believe that God is active. We believe in Jesus's promise that He sent the Holy Spirit to guide His church, and so we can believe even when things look grim. Which look, we're Anglicans, right? Like that. If we're living in Rwanda, life would be great, but we don't. Where we're yeah. in America right now, the vast mm -hmm. majority of our bishops are heretics, and thankfully, the ACNA is doing something about that. Um, the Orthodox Church is going through a very similar thing as mm -hmm. well. And they're, you know, debating with the church in Ukraine and they're fighting universalism in the West. And, uh, you know, Rome has their own problems. We, I've talked about them enough. So we'll just, but yeah. <laughs> we, yeah. we, we can trust that over time, um, think teachings from the apostolic deposit will be upheld by it, enough bishops to keep it going. And ultimately the faithful, the census fide will carry out Orthodox teaching into their faith and practice. Yeah. And that's and that's really what we're what we're saying has already happened when we mm -hmm. appeal to the idea of development of doctrine. So like, you know, a lot of Roman Catholics or Eastern Orthodox, when they see Protestants and we say, oh, we don't think ecumenical councils were infallible or something like that, or they weren't they weren't infallible in themselves, like when they were uttered, which even the Eastern Orthodox don't really believe. But that's a whole other conversation. Like they, they'll say, oh, well, then everything's up for grabs. But that would that would that would deny the idea that that we do believe that truth was vindicated 
in all of these other moments. And so we can, you can easily say, okay, well, I can still say the Nicene Creed. Mm-hmm. I can still say all these things. And, you know, and, and, and that I might even require these things. We can uh, expect um, people to affirm all of these things. And that the the tension points um, that that haven't been resolved yet, we can uh, maybe have some I don't know leeway on. Right, there hasn't been an ecumenical council on. Um, well, maybe this is a bad example because I don't know how some people might see the synod of Dort, but like there hasn't been an ecumenical council deciding Arminianism versus Calvinism. So mm-hmm. we might say, okay, all right, until the last day, we're going to kind of sit in both uh, sit with both camps in our in our denomination. Um, but um, but anything that has been resolved and that has been clearly resolved, um, we can kind of dismiss and say, like, if you don't affirm the, the first four councils is usually the tradition that we received. Right. Like, if you don't explicitly uh, affirm them, then then you're outside of orthodoxy. And we're not really, um, you know, going to waste time. Maybe, you know, you might probably talk, walk with somebody who is really struggling with this and say, here's where in scripture this and the other thing. But we're not really going to waste time debating those things today as much as we might have if we were living through those right. controversies, um, and, and we might just kind of kind of move forward on those things. Uh, the same thing can can be said about even something like the the canon, because people will say, "Oh, how can you have a, a, an infallible canon without an infallible determiner?" And it's like, well, it would be kind of crazy if for the last two thousand years the the New Testament canon that's been recognized by almost all Christians is somehow wrong. Yeah. Like we just don't believe God would do that. Like that would be kind of cruel. Yeah. And we do believe that the role of the visible church was to recognize stuff like that and, and to uh, give us assurance that we're, you know, uh, you know, we're being protected and, 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 and uh, provided for by the Holy spirit on these issues. Right. Well, and, and with the issue of the canon, yeah, that was our first episode at Miriosity. Um mm-hmm. That is, again, what the magisterial reformers and really the Anglicans handled it better than anyone else. Is it Article mm-hmm. 6 or whatever they talk about it? Um, they use this term too, this vindication, this reception. And they yeah. talk about, you know, the 27 books of the New Testament, easy, the uh, the uh, 39 books of the Old. And then they, they talk about the Deuterocanonicals. And they mm-hmm. say, like, we accept these things as they've been received in the church. They use some language like that. Yeah. And so this is not an idea that we just came up with, you know, like this isn't a 21st century scramble uh, to figure out how Catholicity works in a post-Protestant world. Um, Mm -hmm. This was the idea that like, okay, with the issue of the canon, we know these 66 books have been unanimously received, but these, you know, seven for Catholics, 14 for Orthodox, 27 for Ethiopian. Like we looked at the church in Ethiopia, the, the Russian church, the, the, the Western Roman Catholic church, this Assyrian church, they all have disputes over these books. And mm-hmm. so that's, you know, that's where the term Deuterocanon comes from. Yeah. Uh, and so that, even that, that's a great example of what this Catholicity as reception looks like in play. Like we can, hopefully no one's saying these books are evil. I know some people are there. Honestly, there's a lot of fun in them, but it's not, it's not as uh, striking as you might seem. You might read these and be like, why did Luther care so much? There is no, there's not really, um, you, you would think that there is like a proof text for the Pope or something in there. Yeah. Um, but sorry, I've gone on long enough with this. No, that's, I, I think you're right. Yeah. Um, I, I was going to say, I, I think you're totally right about that kind of stance with the, uh, the Deuterocanon, like, I mean, I always think about how in the Anglican tradition, we have liturgical reading from the Deuterocanon, like you can read them in church for Mm -hmm. as the year progresses. Um, And, and, you know, I had, I think, a portion of Tobit read on my my wedding, like that was, they're still useful, and we still have a very high view. I wouldn't read, I don't know, uh, like, a sermon from uh, Tim Keller at my wedding, like, as a private scripture. Like I, I, the Deuterocanon has that place, but you're right. There is this, because we believe in receptionism in this sense, and we, we always have. And, and again, I, I think this is very resonant with the Eastern Orthodox stance on councils and all that kind of stuff. You know, we didn't invent this as Protestants or as Anglicans. Um, you're right to say that, like, because we believe in reception, we can say, um, you know, it's weird that some of these books weren't universally received. So it's not like we hate them or we're throwing them out because they're, Full of lies, but like you read John of Damascus's canon, or you read Jerome having his problems about 
um, some of the deuterocanonical books and you just say, well, I can't know because the reception is the way we know these things. So mm -hmm. um, I think that's, that, that, that's really helpful. Do you think there's any other good um, moments in church history to kind of talk about um, what, you know, the Catholic church is? I can think of one of the, one of the common objections. No, nah, I'm going to, I'm going <laughs> to, I'm going to, this, hopefully this won't derail a little bit. One of the common objections I hear from Roman Catholics or Eastern Orthodox who hear about Anglicans, or even from some actually, you know, very evangelical Anglicans who say, oh, you have this view of the councils that are received, but you don't even know what the church is. So like, it, you know, the Roman Catholic will say, yeah, we believe in receptionism, but receptionism by the Pope. And there's like this mm -hmm. guy and I can point to him and I know for certain that's the Pope and, you know, we can move on. But like, how do we know that, you know, the Coptic church isn't the only true church. And so we have to all become Coptic and only accept the ecumenical councils they've accepted. Um, I have some of my thoughts on that if you want to maybe talk first, but. Well, I think, um, I guess, well, since, since I'm talking with you, I can, I, I guess I'll dive more into this. This is mm -hmm. something we cover on our series in the councils. And I, I wish I had my notebook out, but I, I don't need to have a, a fire list against it. But <laughs> I, I would say, again, Church History 101, your first day in seminary, what they'll tell you is the necessity that Christianity is a historical religion. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I only went to Protestant universities. So Catholics, be be delighted that they are teaching that. <laughs> um and that's important for a few reasons, and I think it's directly tied to reception. But then we, we look at the councils, and again, the magisterial reformers were very patristic. I would argue they were much more patristic than the Roman church was at that time. I don't think Rome really cared that much about the early councils at that moment in time. But what we see in these councils um, is not that argument, um, mm. <laughs> not, not yeah. the papal argument. We actually see multiple times all the way from, I think, the Second Ecumenical Council through the Fifth. By the Seventh, they had really accepted uh, papal claims, and I'll, mm -hmm. I'm willing to concede that. But the, mm -hmm. constantly, they're like, hey, Constantinople is equal in authority with Rome. Hey, mm -hmm. uh, was it the Third Council? Each bishop only has jurisdiction over their own um, diocese that they're a part of. Bishops mm -hmm. can't switch, go to different dioc dioceses. Like, this is, these are canons of the foundation foundational ecumenical councils for the for the church uh and i'm sure someone smarter than me i'm sure joe heschmeyer could uh, tell me why i'm wrong <laughs> but um th this is at least a plain reading from what is supposed to be you know uh, making yeah. an easy interpretation for the layperson and, mm -hmm. and so i would i would just point back again to um reception and i i'm kind of losing the point i was trying to make which is why i didn't want to talk too much about catholic <laughs> oh you're i think but uh doing, yeah the being in being in line with history one has to be consistent uh the more mm -hmm. councils you have the trickier that's going to be that's why we trust that yeah. the holy spirit is guiding it uh the holy spirit the holy spirit's not overwhelmed with all the canons of the seven councils um mm -hmm. and so transitioning into today if if i can because uh, mm -hmm. I, I would like to hear your thoughts on this. Um, I see the bubbling of what might look like a very odd um, and different than we've ever seen ecumenical council happening now. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and we saw at Vatican II, it was weird enough because they had a bunch of Protestant pastors there just kind of see, watching, which was yeah. awesome. Like, I, I really appreciated that. And now we're in this moment where the Pope is receiving blessings from the Archbishop of Canterbury. Uh, mm -hmm. He's allowing Anglican masses to happen in Catholic churches. Uh, whether you think that's true or not, the, the Vicar of Christ is, is <laughs> allowing mm -hmm. those things to take place. Um, or I don't know how great Orthodox and Catholic conversations are going. But the mm -hmm. big, there are two elephants in the room. One I'm more comfortable talking about, but I'll try not to be a coward. Uh, one, hum human sexuality. Yeah. And, and yeah. two, how that relates to ordination. Yeah, the, that is going to require a ecumenical statement. And I don't know what it's going to look like. Um, I don't think that the Catholic Church is going to invite Orthodox and Anglican bishops to come and vote on this. But mm -hmm. that would be cool. Um, yeah. But so, there is we see now it's a little different because we have it's actually bottom up um, mm -hmm. because of the nature of the Reformation where the, the church on this ground level is taking stances, orthodox stances on these things, and it's yet to reach the higher ups. Yeah, 
I actually think, I think, and you know, there's the generational kind of staggering. I think we see this a lot in even the Anglican tradition, but also I would say in the Roman tradition where it seems like people our age who are really, you know, invested in theology and in, and in Christian doctrine, like we've talked about in our last conversation, the kind of trad revival of like the idea, like if I'm going to be Christian, I'm going to take it seriously. And I don't, and I don't want to apologize for church history, you know, and, and what the faith has always taught. Like, I just want to have the faith, like the Catholic faith given to the apostles, like unapologetically, you know, um, and, and on these culture war issues, we're not afraid to kind of mince words versus, you know, I think older generations are a lot more cautious to kind of make people happy about this, even if they do have kind of, um, orthodox stances on these different mm -hmm. issues and you're right I do think there is a kind of a bubbling up but on the other hand you know I always wonder why the you know maybe be to to make the evangelical Anglicans feel, Anglicans feel better but things like the Jerusalem statement in our tradition like that mm -hmm. are more recently are basically ecumenical statements within well ecumenical they're they're denominational statements all of the Anglican most of the Anglican communion got together um mm -hmm. at at Jerusalem to say, hey, here is the Anglican stance on human sexuality, and like we're going to stick to it, and you know, and then in Kigali there was eighty-five percent of the communion again saying, you know, the Archbishop of Canterbury can't bless same-sex unions and all those kinds of things, and uh, kind of saying like this is the stance of the of the Anglican communion, and in a lot of ways this kind of has recreated an, a kind of conciliar nature in the mm -hmm. in the Anglican communion, and you know, as far as I can tell, there, it's, it's kind of the only, we're kind of the only communion who's made definitive statements on these issues in that way. And I think you're mm -hmm. right. There probably will in the near future have to be um, kind of ecumenical or, you know, dialogues between the, the kind of different denominations to kind of settle these issues. You know, I can't, you know, people will say, oh, how do you know what the true church is? How do you know what a valid ecumenical council is? But if the Roman magisterium and the Eastern Orthodox bishops and the Anglican bishops all got in the Coptic bishops, maybe got, got together for a council to hash out their disagreements. I think it would not be that hard to recognize that that was an ecumenical right. mo movement of the, yeah. of, of the body of Christ. So even movements within the denomination can kind of have a kind of uh, authority and yeah, maybe we won't want to get too far in, into, these, <laughs> into these issues, but I do think you're right. I think that, that, they, that these issues are kind of the ecumenical council issues, the development of doctrine issues, if you will, uh, of our day. Because, you know, 400, 500 years ago, we wouldn't have had to articulate cleanly, like, this is what the doctrine of marriage is in the Christian church, mm -hmm. um, because it wasn't a controversy. And now it is right. a controversy. So we do have to have to talk about that. Um and I think it's actually a perfect example of how we would talk about all of the other developments, right? Before the the, the the council or whatever the articulation was, it wasn't like people didn't believe what the Orthodox opinion was. They just they just hadn't um, had to combat uh, heresy about it. They hadn't had to have the kind of trials and tribulations to to address these issues like we've we've had to, to do as our history has progressed yeah. as a church, as a as the body of Christ. Yeah, and I do I do appreciate your shout out because Anglicans get so much flack for their instability. But honestly, mm -hmm. the, the Jerusalem Declaration, uh, I mean, that's what a local council looks like. That's what yeah. the church has done throughout history. And they spoke on, you know, it, it was either 1998 or 2001 that the mm -hmm. Anglican communion itself made a statement affirming traditional sexuality. And yeah. what the what the Jerusalem Declaration is, is, again, the part of this bubbling up, the authorities in the church saying we need to have another local council because you're not enforcing this. Yeah. And so there is here's this. That's my brief shout out for Anglicanism right now. <laughs> yeah. in, in a world where all the apostolic churches are going in a frenzy. Um, mm -hmm. Now, we the women's ordination thing is something else, depending on where people stand on that. But there is an actual surprising amount of stability in the Anglican church right now worldwide. Um, yeah. And there are in the few heretical uh, designations throughout the world, there are options. So that's not I'm glad you brought that up. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I, th I think it's valid. I think it was Lambeth 1991 or something where oh, 91. Was, re yeah. was articulated. And you're right. Jerusalem was just a reaffirmation of that of Lambeth, um, but which were used to be more regular. But they're kind of, you know, we're having to re mm -hmm. redesign the instruments of communion. Um, and to, yeah, to us in the Western world, it feels like, oh, the Anglicans are so divided. Well, that's really just because Anglicans aren't divided. And this church 
that is what used to be the representative of the American Anglican expression has deviated from the global uniformity on this issue. And mm -hmm. so there have been divisions locally to us, but it's not really representative of a, of a global um, division, especially right. when you start, you, you know, adjusting for which parts of the world actually have people regularly attending churches. Like the mm -hmm. church of Nigeria is the biggest Anglican church in the world, not the church of England, even though we're all called Anglicans, you know? Mm -hmm. So are, is it, are the English church, is it more or less representative of the Anglican position on these things? I think, um, if you have a conciliar view, if you have a receptionist view, like we're talking about now, it, you would just say, oh, well, where are, there, where are the churches speaking more uniformly and a, on a larger, more profounder scale? That is the, the, the vindication element of, 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 of development. In mm -hmm. a way. Yeah. Or the, what do you call it? The census fide, if you will, yeah. the sense of the faithful. Yeah. So, yeah, I think that was, a, I think that was a great, you know, summary or, or, or kind of uh, overview of the the or at least an Anglican <laughs> view of development of doctrine how you could articulate development of doctrine how magisterial Protestants look at development of doctrine um, and and why it might be okay to use the word development now in my in my personal opinion maybe words like development imply like new things being added you could you should maybe use a different word like the vindication of orthodoxy or something like that but um, that's just the word we've received development of doctrine. Like we can have issue with John Henry Newman's label or not, but um, the, the only, the, the big difference would be that the Protestant can recognize that the concept of development of doctrine can go too far. And that we would say that in the Roman system for, as a, as a marker of this, they, they have, you know, they understand development. Newman had, you know, had this understanding of development. But I think it's important to highlight that even John Henry Newman, if you read his essay on development of doctrine, he doesn't talk that much about the papacy. Why? Vatican I hadn't happened yet. Mm. And so he doesn't see the papacy's role in the development of doctrine as, as coherently as we might today after Vatican I. And then you get Vatican II and you get all of the, you know, the recent controversies on the death penalty and all that kind of stuff. And we would say that that is a, a kind of abuse of the idea of development of doctrine and that that it can be abused. That's all that the Protestant is saying is that, you know, on the one side, there's the restorationists who reject the concept wholesale. We would say that's wrong. But on the other on the other end, the reason restorationists maybe exist is because it's clear that sometimes people can just change their doctrine and then say, oh, it was development and move on. And we wouldn't want to accept that either. Right. And, and I think that's probably the last thing I'll say um, while we're wrapping up. Mm -hmm. is it's important to that to know the difference between development of doctrine and what I call, and we've talked about before, development of soteriology. Yeah. So remember, consistency is key to a part of these things. And one thing that you brought up uh, last time we spoke was you like the Athanasian Creed because it mm -hmm. says this is what you, if you believe this, you're a Christian and you're going to go to heaven, basically. Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. not, not basically. I don't need to clear, modify that. Yeah, you're going to heaven if you like actively believe these things. Um, so if there is a development of doctrine that becomes a development of soteriology that adds to that list, what's represented in the Nicene Athanasian Creed and what is taught in scripture, remember they're all consistent, th th then it's either one, just plain not true, um, or two, it cannot be mandated uh, for you, which is uh, another thing that the Anglicans were big on. But um, yeah, development of doctrine is not development of soteriology. And it's important that we don't conflate them. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. I totally just cut out. I don't know if I, if I missed the whole thing you just said or not. Um, but I, for, if, I'm, if I'm not mistaken, you're talking about development of soteriology and kind of adding things to the deposit of faith. And, and you're right. If you read the Athanasian Creed, he just says, these are the things you have to believe. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he doesn't mention the papacy, doesn't mention anything about Mary, doesn't mention any of this stuff. Um, if I, if I, if I, if I made it, if I'm correct ba about Basically. Yeah. And, and it doesn't mean, it doesn't mean those things aren't necessarily true. Uh, it just mm -hmm. means that we can't conflate, like uh, there are tons of Anglicans who would probably uphold all four Marian dogmas, um, you know, mm -hmm. depending on what, how high of an Anglican church you're in. Uh, yeah. But, but the key there is uh, mandating it and, and just not conflating. Development of doctrine is not development of soteriology. Um, yeah. And the former is just true, natural, uh, God working through this historical religion. The latter is often used for manipulation. Uh, yeah. The same, the same thing that was required for salvation two thousand years ago is what's required of you today. Yeah, absolutely.
Amen. All right. I think it's time to wrap it up. That was a great conversation. I think we 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 touched a lot of the stuff I wanted to talk about with development of doctrine. I think that went um I went really well and it was a good overview. Hopefully, if people were trying to learn like what is the stance of development of doctrine, this video was helpful. Um, if you want to check out more of Andrew's stuff and the, the content he's making over at Muriosity, he talks a lot about church history, church councils, uh, development of doctrine kind of has a lot to do with the, the history of the church um, over at Muriosity. I think they just, you guys just finished your series on the ecumenical councils now. We did. And I think we're going to talk about the restorationists next week. So this will be a good in uh, intro. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So be sure to check out Muriosity. They have, they have a YouTube channel also are on Spotify and I know mm -hmm. other uh, podcast um, uh, places. And so definitely be sure to check them out. Anything right. else you want to say before we wrap up, Andrew? No, just thank you for having me on. Always fun. Yeah, no problem. All right. Thanks so much for watching and God bless.